we've structured this session to be a brief overview of the context of the care economy and women. Um, and then I'll move into an introduction of our panelists. And then we'll take a few discussion questions or I'll pose those to our panelists. Um, and then we'll move into an open Q&A. And so I really encourage you all to use the chat function to make any comments or to post any questions that you may have that come up uh, throughout the course of discussion. And of course, if you um, please feel welcome to even make an introduction to yourself so we know who's in the room and, um, and yeah, we would love to just uh, meet you all. So with that, I'm happy to kick things off. Um, I'll be throwing a few kind of numbers and data at you, so bear with me, but I do feel like they're quite meaningful um, uh, statistics that are worth uh, sharing and highlighting. Um, so this session that we will be uh, engaging in today is about women care workers and care work, which we're defining to be caring for young children, the elderly and special needs care, including uh, and encompassing domestic work and volunteer work is fundamentally important because it's a universal human need and without which no society or economy could function. And so we believe that care work is valuable yet undervalued work. Women make up nearly 70% of the workers in the care economy, most of whom are either unpaid or in positions that are poorly paid, insecure, and often considered to be low status. And the gender imbalance is significant. When women do three times more care work than men, uh, and this is about 4.4 hours per day versus 1.4 hours per day for men. And 50, about 50% 50 of women in low and middle income countries are not in the labor force due to unpaid care work burdens. So in 2018, this was 606 million women globally compared to 41 million men. And the ILO reports that the majority of women prefer to work in paid jobs. And so we believe that there are systematic erasures of the value of care work, which are limiting women's economic participation. So even when paid, care workers often fall outside the social benefit system and receive low wages because of systemic gender biases and compensation. Research has shown that the median hourly wage declines by 21% as industries become predominantly female versus male. And that women are 25% more likely to drop out of the workforce after having, child, having a child due to the care burden. And mothers have the lowest employment rates of 47.6% and suffer a 23% wage loss versus women without children. Uh, and this all comes together to, um, to show us that the undervaluation of care work has resulted in significant gender gaps in income and wealth for women. And there's no country where women and men perform an, e perform an equal share of unpaid care work. Um, and as a result, women are constantly time poor, which constrains their ability to participate in the labor market. And lastly, I would like to highlight that with the current context and the, the COVID-19 crisis, this has revealed just how essential all health, social, child, and domestic care workers are to our economy. It has shown us the importance of investing in a robust care system and has amplified the unequal burden of care uh, that women have and how undervalued this work has been to date. So in this panel session, we're hoping to create awareness of the care economy globally and the state of care work. We hope to cover some components and actions businesses and the private sector can take to better protect care workers and accelerate the growth of the ecosystem across uh, Asia and Africa. And we'd also like to connect the various types of entities that share in this vision of creating a more caring economy. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce the impressive group of panelists that we have today. Uh, you'll find that they represent a, a diverse area of the care economy and come with their own unique views on care work. And we believe that moving towards a more caring economy is a journey and that the businesses that are represent and organizations that are represented here are generously sharing their time and experience with where they are at in that journey. Um, and it's in, in very various stages. Uh, so as moderator, I will kick things off with a brief introduction of myself, and then I will move to our panelists. Uh, so 
I'm Anuradha Shetty. I'm a principal at the Soros Economic Development Fund, which can be considered to be the impact investing arm of the Open Societies Foundation. And in case you're not familiar, the Open Societies Foundation is a large global philanthropic organization that's focused on human rights, on social justice, and democratic values. The care economy is an important issue to the Open Societies Foundation, and it's approached in different ways, uh, mostly through grant making and advocacy targeting governments, economists, worker organi organi organizing bodies, women's rights movements, and issues around migrants and refugees. At uh, SARS Economic Development Fund, we have a new investment strategy that we've uh, we kicked off in the middle of uh, 2020 to, that is focused entirely on women as paid and unpaid carers with the aim, with the end aim of advancing economic, uh, women's economic justice. So in this strategy, we're focusing on investment opportunities that will reduce the time poverty uh, to time poverty due to unpaid care work burden that women face, meaning that we're looking for affordable, accessible labor saving technologies, products and services. And we're also looking for businesses that are providing access to affordable and quality care for children, elderly people, or people with special needs. And we're also focusing on paid care workers. And given that the majority of these workers are women and often in low value and vulnerable employment, and not covered by any benefits. We're looking for opportunities that will improve the options and quality of care work. So companies that provide the opportunities for training and upscaling, job matching platforms, facilitating access to social protections or enhanced benefits and the like. And lastly, we're looking to engage other field actors to help us demonstrate the financial viability of investing in a care economy and to help crowd in capital here and increase awareness of the needs to improve the situation of women working in unpaid and paid care work. And I think I just wanna add that uh, with our investments, we'd also like to see how we can help change the narrative around care work being just for women. Uh, this is vital work and we believe that the responsibilities can and should be carried out by both uh, men and women and have a better balance, uh, a better gender balance. Uh, so I would love to move into our introductions of our panelists. Um, I will start with uh, Sylvia. How about you? Okay, thanks so much. I know. Thanks um, for handing over to me and for having me here today um, and my company. So my name is Sylvia. I am the co-founder and managing director of a company called KHM in South Africa. Uh, we are operating nationwide in South Africa. And um, we basically provide uh, care, home nursing, home care across South African individual people's homes, mostly the elderly. That's our core target market. And the majority of our care workers are females. As you already mentioned, Anu, that is um, very normal yeah, uh, across the globe for now. And also in our case, like I would say 97% female dominated, uh, the profession of, of nurse, nursing, as well as caring, is actually very highly regarded in South Africa. So it's actually um, a, a desired profession for a lot of females to, to be in, uh, something to be very proud of, uh, with obviously a big social impact attached to it. Uh, my organization or company has been around for close to four years now. And so we're still relatively young. Uh, we are a private company, so it's all paid for care workers, picking up on what you said, Anu. Um, we are operating on the higher end of the market. So also our care workers are on the higher end pay level yeah, of the market. Um, I would say we work with the best in the industry in our country. And um, we are employing currently in excess of 100 people that are on our payroll and uh, that we... Um, very much, I would say, look after with various incentive programs and uh, with various different opportunities for them to further, uh, not just on monetary levels, but also career level. Yeah, thank you so much. Great, sorry, got stuck with the mute. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. Uh, how about we move to AK? 
Thank you. Thank you, Anu. Um, and thank you, organizers, for having me on this panel. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be a part of this panel today. Um, I am the CEO of Clay. Clay is a nine-year-old brand um, based out of India. We operate in the seven major cities of India, and we run uh, an integrated daycare slash preschool system across these seven cities. So we operate close to 150 such preschools uh, slash daycares um, and have a enrollment of about 10,000 plus children, uh, which kind of makes us one of the largest um, completely owned company owned company operated uh, daycare slash preschool chains in India. Um, we employ close to um, 3,500 people in our system. 95% um, of them are women and 70% uh, would probably come under the care category. So we take care of children from the ages of six months onwards. Um, so six months to six years, although uh, in terms of after school daycare, we carry on the um, <clears throat> care element up to 10 years of age. Um, this project started nine years ago, thanks to the vision of our founder, Priya Krishnan. Uh, and the vision was to enable women to get back to work um, after they have their child. Um, good quality, um, you know, daycare preschool systems at that point in time uh, were a rarity in India, as they still are. There are a handful of people who give high quality um, uh, services of this nature. A majority of them tend to be mom and pop owned. Um, places which have little or no uh, repute in, or expertise of how to take care of children. So uh, over nine years, we've helped about 30,000 plus women get back to work. And um, of course, we're very proud of it. We're still counting. Uh, we're hoping to see the numbers go up higher and higher. Um, so that's us in a nutshell. Thanks, Anu. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then next, I will move to Elizabeth, who we consider to be our kind of sector expert as it relates to um, care work and domestic workers. Elizabeth? Uh, hello, I'm Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for these opportunities uh, to meet new friends. Uh, I'm the General Secretary of the International Domestic Workers Federation, uh, which is uh, uh, a global union of uh, domestic workers, uh, including migrant domestic workers and also local domestic workers. Uh, our organization was established uh, seven years ago, 2013, uh, and our objective is to uh, reclaim rights uh, for domestic workers, uh, because even though there are almost 70, 70 million of domestic workers in the world, but still majority are not considered as workers because people usually consider domestic work uh, as a women's work, uh, is free and, and of very low value. Uh, so uh, our members and domestic workers around the world still uh, are not considered as workers and are not uh, covered by uh, labor law protections. So over 80% still lack uh, protection over minimum wage, uh, working hours or, or social protections. Uh, and uh, uh, during this time, uh, under the COVID-19, uh, we are badly impacted. Uh, because of loss of income, loss of livelihood, but without any social protections. Uh, but uh, we provide a very important and uh, an invaluable um, uh, work to, the, to support families, uh, to support employers. Uh, so uh, we believe that, um, uh, you know, governments, employers, uh, you know, should work together with us uh, to to lift up the standards, uh, but also the working conditions for domestic workers. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and so thank you, panelists, for your, for your inter, uh, introductions uh, to yourselves and to your organizations. Uh, and then I, I think it would be great to kind of shift our discussion to some questions that I've prepared uh, that I think will kind of bring us into a more uh, detailed discussion about care work and women. Uh, sorry, I'll just stop sharing my screen. And so I think I'd start with first a question to AK and to Sylvia, uh, and then I'll move into a question for Elizabeth. Um, and so the question is, how have your businesses approached uh, improving working conditions and benefits for women that are working in these care sectors in your respective countries? And then with that, have you faced any barriers or found any aspect to be particularly difficult? Uh, so, yeah, AK, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure, if, if that's okay, Sylvia, I'll take that first and maybe, will that work? Oops, I went blank for a second. Am I back? Yeah, <laughs> not sure if that's my laptop or the network outside. Um, we uh, have been very proud of what we brought to the table for the care workers, especially in a country like India where um, care workers actually uh, are probably the most neglected in the pyramid of um, work done by uh, female uh, employees of any kind. Uh, one background we'll have to keep in mind is about 85 to 90 percent of employment at this level in India tends to be with the unorganized sector, which means that none of the benefits that the government has thought out for reach these employees. They're actually the most exploited of the whole population in many ways. Um, at Clay, we've made a small contribution towards helping some of them. I know the numbers in India tend to be magnified, huge. Uh, what we are talking about within the Clay system is 3,500 plus growing, but it's still a very small number compared to what can be done in India. But what we've managed to do is first and foremost, bring in all the compliances that the government has set out. Now the government of India has put together a set of regulations, legislations, which protect the um, care workers. Unfortunately, very little of it comes down to the ground. So the first things first, we've made sure that we're compliant on every single aspect. And then we've seen how we can go beyond that. So the most important thing we do is, you know, pay them their salaries that are due to them and pay them on time. These are basic fundamental tenets which don't get followed in most of India, especially in the unorganized sector. They all get healthcare benefits for themselves and their families. They get a work-life balance. Now that's something that's unheard of in the sector. Most people uh, work extremely long hours, sometimes way over what they should be uh, by law, sometimes over the weekends. We've managed to make sure that we bring a certain work-life balance to these people's lives. We've also taken care to train them and regularly upskill them. So people who joined us, let's say three years, five years ago have actually moved on within us to much better positions. Some of them have moved out, taking out much better positions. They've been coming to a position where their children actually are getting far better education than they ever could. And that makes us very proud of what we're able to do. So I think the biggest difference we brought to their life is to give them what's their due first and then try and give them a little more than that. Um, of course, we try to provide a very conducive workspace as well. So we've been rated amongst the great place to work in India for two years in a row now. And both years we've come in the top 100. <clears throat> Caregivers are a part of that survey, given that they are 75% of our whole workforce. And one thing they find is that um, most of them are delighted by the work um, uh, environment that we're able to keep. There's a certain level of transparency and they do have a voice that's heard and heard very loud and clear. It makes a huge difference for them, right? Um, so what have we <clears throat> faced as impediments in getting more people into it? Now you would imagine that with such a large population, getting care workers should be actually very simple, but in India, it's actually not. And the reason for that is a huge majority of people in that economic strata do not have any documents that prove that they are 
a resident of that city or even that country. There's a huge number of people here who have no papers validating their existence at all. When it comes to care work for children, there's very strict background verification checks we have to do given the nature of the job. And it becomes a very big problem for us to solve for given that there's no identity card, no bank account, no permanent address. And I think these are things that should have been fundamentally solved by the government for people, so many people that are living in the country, if they have no basis of opening even a bank account in the country, how are, how are we to go ahead and help them is a question we keep having in these meetings. And it's, it's such a large problem that out of every 10 people we recruit, we find that six or seven of them don't have any identification at all. So the problem is huge, especially at that sector of the economy. I wouldn't say that is true when you come to teachers and when you come to the management staff, definitely not. But at that level, it is a very serious problem. Apart from this, the labor laws are so archaic. Most of them were formed in India between 1940 and 1950, which means we're talking about laws that are 60 to 70 years old. Very few amendments in the laws have been made. These laws are so draconic in some sense that it actually impels entrepreneurs to go the way around it and try to take people on a contract basis or without any employment. A part of the exploitation is actually driven by the very laws that were made to prevent it. It's a strange paradox over here, but <clears throat> given that the laws tend to be so lopsided in favor of the unions and the caregivers that the caregivers actually end up foregoing that law. Instead of putting an element of trust between the employer and the employee, it actually works as a barrier between the two. Now, of course, I could go on about this for a day and a half. And uh, um, there's, there's just so much to be discussed with respect to India alone. But like the rest of the viewers here, I am extremely excited to hear about uh, South Africa and about uh, the other parts of the world as well. So um, I'll pass it over to you, Sylvia. Thanks, AK. I must say that's inspiring to hear from you and uh, obviously a lot that we can learn from you and, and Clay and all you have achieved in the nine years. So really well done. So I've taken notes here <laughs> already. What can be done on, on our side? I mean, South Africa obviously has certain different setup and, and different challenges, but a lot of what you say very much resonates. And I mean, I don't want to repeat, but uh, interesting what you said on the salaries due and on time, you know, it's actually shocking, right? How many companies don't do that? And like to add to your comment, and I don't know how, how you guys do it, but we have established paying weekly, which makes such a difference to, to our caregivers. Um, just because cash flow, cash flow is absolute key. Huh? And transport costs are relatively high I'm not sure if the rest of the panel uh, agrees with me in the various countries, but in South Africa, it's actually a shocking stat that a lot of the care workers would spend up to 30% of their income on transport to actually get to and from work. And if you consider that, it, it makes a huge impact. You cannot let a caregiver wait for their salary for a month. It is absolutely impossible. So just simple insights like that are absolutely uh, important to establish yeah, to make a work relationship possible with someone. So by us establishing the weekly pay made our caregivers extremely happy. Um, the, ups, the upskilling, the regular training is very much appreciated because as I pre previously mentioned, our kids are very proud of their work and nursing is a very proud profession in South Africa. So, um, and I kind of use that interlink because nursing is kind of the overall term uh, that we are using here. So it is really staying up to speed and, and, and being proud of what you do is, is a big part for our caregivers. Something else that we have established is uh, awards, rewards. So really, really bringing to light fantastic work people do, because as we said, a lot is in the field a lot is sometimes unseen. Uh, so bringing that to light, treating people as a team, we call them, my company is called K-Champ, we call them champs for champions, immediately uplifting. Yeah? Like it is really a champion work you do. It is so important. And I know you mentioned that. I mean, K-Work is absolutely a pillar. It's a backbone of our economy uh, in a lot of our countries, of course. Uh, something else we've established is employer loans. And that comes to barriers, actually, the discussion of barriers. So because caregivers are often maybe in independent contractor positions or don't have yet enough salary history or uh, maybe don't earn to the level that a bank would grant uh, loans, 
uh, we have decided to offer employer loans to people that qualify. We've set certain relatively easily reachable qualifying criteria and we have also, are also offering them at a very reasonable rate because I'm not saying the banks are evil at all. It's very difficult for them because a lot of it is unsecured, right? Whilst we can very much better control that uh, given people also work for us. So uh, that is very much appreciated giving an, a, a sector that usually had a difficulty in accessing capital, the possibility to access certain credit lines uh, loans and hopefully accumulate asset that actually ultimately increases, um, yeah, increases wealth in the long term uh, of the sector and, and get a lot of people out of the poverty trap. So yes, th so that's a few things that, that we've been doing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you both. It is actually very inspiring to hear, uh, as, as I mentioned in the intro, the different the journeys that you are both on. And I think it's already above uh, what most companies are doing. So it's, it's very inspiring to hear. Um, I'd love to turn to Elizabeth uh, and ask, uh, you know, for, what, for businesses that want to move in this direction with their workers, what are some low hanging fruit measures that they can or should consider taking? And I ask, I understand that you know, IDWF is really kind of focused around organizing workers and, and working with unions. But uh, I, I understand that there has been, um, you know, opportunities to work with private sectors or with businesses. So I'd love to hear uh, your take on what you think, uh, you know, businesses can do. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, for a lot of all of us, uh, first, uh, uh, we have to know that the care sector is a growing sector. Uh, in a lot of sector industries, uh, you know, we are talking about decline of uh, employment, uh, decline of demands, but uh, definitely uh, care sector is, is growing. Uh, uh, the, the ILO report uh, is saying that uh, in the next 10 to 12 years, uh, you know, there could uh, be an addition of over a million jobs in, in the sector. So this is exciting news for us and, and it makes it uh, all the more important that uh, employers and workers, uh, you know, should work together uh, to improve the situation in these sectors, you know, so that uh, it can really uh, uh, change, uh, you know, for the benefits of the carers and also for the for, for those who need care. Uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 the first and foremost uh, for us to work together is is really to get. Uh, a, a proper uh, legal framework that can define the, uh, the standards uh, of, of care, uh, you know, that will benefit uh, those who need care, uh, but also the terms of employment for those who provide care, you know, the, the care workers. Uh, yeah, as I said uh, at the beginning, over 80% of the workers in these sectors still are not protected by uh, any legislations, you know, they do not enjoy any social uh, protections. Uh, and that makes it, you know, always uh, the last job option for, for people. And, 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 and that is, uh, uh, you know, the main reason, you know, why very often we, we do not get, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, who are really uh, uh, qualified uh, and, and because, uh, you know, it is always the last option, the last job option. And, and, and that needs to be changed and, and can be changed. Uh, and uh, and also we believe that uh, you know when when there is uh, uh, when there are rules you know uh, properly uh, established, uh, then uh, you know all the all the employers, you no know, companies, and, and even workers, you know are, are competing on a fair uh, playing field. You know, rather than by succeeding, you know, uh, uh, because you can squeeze uh, each other 
out or you you can squeeze uh, the, the workers you know who who don't have any any protections uh, but uh, we believe you know when there are proper uh, rules when there are proper protections uh, that will make uh, workers uh, have a decent uh, work life but then they will also be happy workers and happy workers will will will, will provide uh, you know quality service and and that is what uh, our society need and, and and the carers needs Thank you, Elizabeth. And it's, I, my next question, I think you're sort of touching on it here and Sylvia may have uh, touched on it as well. And it's, it's a bit of a tough question. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, but my question is, um, how do you think there can be better alignment of incentives between workers and their employment employers or businesses to prevent that exploitation? Mm -hmm. uh, meaning like, how can we address the often competing priorities of pay and profits so that those that are actually carrying out this <laughs> valuable service and actually the core of the business are not the first to get squeezed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when when companies are looking to turn that profit. Mm -hmm. Any volunteers? Yeah. <laughs> so? yeah, maybe I I can uh, continue. Um, uh, we believe there is a way uh, because uh, in uh, in some countries, for example, in the U.S., uh, our our affiliates is uh, uh, working in a coalition, uh, bringing uh, employers uh, and also the, uh, the the workers and also the the care uh, recipients uh, together uh, because uh, they they identify the. Uh, uh, the common interest, you know, that is that they, they all need uh, uh, quality uh, care and also they need uh, quality um, uh, 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 protections. So uh, they, uh, they come together and then uh, they, uh, you know, advocate uh, to the governments, you know, for establishing rules uh, I mean, even though we are talking about U.S., but uh, the, uh, the the conditions and and the legal frameworks to regulate this industry is also uh, a very uh, um, a piecemeal. So they they come together and 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 they also work together to uh, you know for a more comprehensive uh, a framework. Um, so. Uh, uh, the, the difficulty I see in, in most uh, places is that uh, uh, dialogue between workers and employers or between management and the workers is always uh, not there. Um, I appreciate very much uh, when AK talk about Clay, which uh, values the, the voice of workers. Uh, and, and I believe this is always the first step, you know, when, uh, when employers, uh, you know, create an environment that, uh, you know, workers will also give their opinion, give their suggestions, uh, and, and that, uh, you know, social dialogue can exist and, and, and together they can identify the common interest, the common area to work together. And this is always the first step. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, AK or Sylvia? Sure. Thanks, Anu. Um, I think at Clay, uh, we have tried to maintain a balance between uh, profitability and what people make out of it uh, at all levels. So any increments, any incentives that are paid out typically get paid out to the whole company um, and are in line with profits. Uh, now, given that uh, ours has been a company that's only nine years old and it's only two years ago that we actually started making profits. Um, so the whole incentivization on profits thing is fairly new to us, but, you know, with the increments and the longevity of the system, longevity in the system, the caregivers actually end up making a lot, lot beyond minimum wages. Minimum wages don't grow at the rate at which our employees grow. So we managed to keep that in tandem. In our case, it's extremely important because the quality of service we offer is typically a benchmark of how these caregivers deliver on the job. So our whole growth story has been one that they have led in many ways. 
I must say, we sitting in the corporate office make strategies, but those are the guys who are actually delivering it. So to us, they are incredibly important. Um, I think, but on a larger level, the question is very relevant and rather difficult to answer because the more, uh, so there's two aspects to it. One, as technology comes in, these are the people who first get hit on the job front because it's replacing their jobs that most entrepreneurs are talking about. It's not talking about removing the middle management or the layers of management that we have. It usually talks about how many on the shop floor or on the work floor that we get rid of, right? So that is an ever present problem. In India, of course, many of these technological solutions turn out to be more expensive than having manpower, which is why you still find a lot of, uh, a lot of companies, whether it be education like ours, whether it be facilities management, uh, they tend to be very manpower concentric, um, which is actually a cheaper solution than um, getting some kind of equipment imported from UK or US, which actually will turn out to be much more expensive. So we're still in that stage in many industries. I'm not saying all industries. Having said which, this, a, this idea of profits versus paying the, the innovative, the forward thinking groups in India and probably the whole world have made sure that as long as we keep our people happy, they keep our customers happy. And if they've had the foresight to do that, those are good companies to work for. A large majority who look at short term gains will sort of maximize their profit on the short term. That profit doesn't last very long. Uh, because people keep leaving and the cost of upskilling and training new people that you're recruiting actually works out to be far more expensive than having paid the incentive in the first place. So I think that's an ongoing dialogue, Anu. I don't think we'll find an immediate solution uh, with education, with um, more opportunities coming up. I think um, people get more aware that on a long term, the only sustainable business is if your employees move with you. And I don't mean employees doesn't mean the ones who sit in the corporate office alone. I mean, every employee in the system. So a bit of that has to come in. Yeah, just to add from, from my side briefly, Anu, I mean, a lot was already said by, by Elizabeth and, and AK. So thanks, completely agree, um, especially, yeah. Thanks. I mean, a lot from what I hear on the private sector, I, I, I absolutely agree. It's about, I don't even consider minimum wage, you know, like we are so far above that in a way that, I mean, South Africa also minimum wage is very low, that this is not even like worth a consideration. We are uh, privately run, we provide a superior service. We would not necessarily price dump and our employees participate directly in the way we do business. Yeah, so, uh, and I also, I completely agree that that's the way to, to successfully run a business and keep your employees long-term, um, happy, engaged, involved, proud, yeah, also of what they do. So absolutely. Uh, South Africa also, uh, workforce is still, despite the fact, what I just said, we don't need to consider minimum wage, but even if we consider double that wage, it's still relatively cheap yeah, in Africa uh, compared to like Europe or the States. So a lot of the tech solutions are not yet replacing the labor force, luckily, especially for our topic here. I also, I have to say in our case, I can't see that happen any, any way in the, in the, in the short term uh, uh, next few years, because it is definitely still a very manual service uh, labor that we provide, especially to the elderly. So wonderful to know that our workforce will still definitely stay there. What I would like to add to what has already been said is, I think what we do quite well is the narrative. Like we, we, we run a lot of content pieces, a lot of PR around caregiving. Because caregiving is not just like you're paid for workers, it's like family caregivers. It's, you know, like nearly everyone has already done the job of a care worker at some stage or the other, or definitely knows people that have done it and knows how hard it is. Yeah. So if you can drive the narrative and, and tell it and, and play it, there's also then pride that comes with doing it and a kind of a responsibility in a business to consumer environment to understand that people need to be paid properly. Yeah. So um, I think this is something we're doing quite strongly and, and, and successfully to make people aware that this is not okay. Yeah? not to pay people right. And also we're driving this narrative of the transport, which I mentioned earlier. A lot of people that live cushiony in their beautiful little spaces, you know, and don't have to take the, the long transport hours to get to work are actually not aware of the 30% that go towards it. So the more you drive the narrative and create the content and, and tell it, 
the more people are aware, oh no, yeah, right. That is not okay to pay minimum wage. Yeah, no one can live from that. So um, yeah, that's my contribution to that question. Thank you, Sylvia. And I, I, I love that you are doing that, um, that type of campaigning. Um, and that actually helps lead to my next question, um, which is how, what role can investors play in supporting the private sector to recognize care work? And like, what value add do you think investors can and should bring to investee companies? And I think this relates to what you were saying before, because at least with SEDF and the strategy that we're taking, our thought is that when we make investments that we would um, use the advocacy resources that we have or potentially some technical assistance to help uh, see what ways we can change narrative. So it's whether it's around valuing care work, it's around again, like the narrative change of uh, who does care work. It's uh, that's one way that we think that we can kind of add value beyond just capital to uh, you know the larger system. Um, but I'd love to hear it from uh, you know from the in the, the company's point of view, and then also Elizabeth, if there's anything you know that you've seen or that you would um, want to highlight, please feel free as well. Um, Ak. Yeah. Um, one, of course, beyond the obvious thing that investors can help increase the uh, chain of what we do or the scope of what we do, and therefore that leads to a larger employment. I mean, that's the straight answer. But one thing I've seen investors come in very strongly with is enforcing compliance on the companies they invest in. And um, I think given that if you want to grow your business at some point in time you would be looking at investments and people who've been taking shortcuts would therefore not be privy to such investments itself could be a game changer on the long run as businesses develop so i think by the very nature of the amount of diligence into the compliance aspects the health and safety aspects the employee relationships the environment of work i mean i know for a fact that open society did uh, we did go through all of this in our earlier discussions. So companies such as this, which look into these aspects and value them before they put in the money, instead of just saying, okay, I'm putting this much money, this is what I want out of it, which looks like a very banking transaction at best. So by the fact that you are able to bring in these aspects to the table will force many companies to turn around their practices if they want to have access to that kind of capital, which I think most businesses do at some time if they want to grow. So I think in that sense, apart from spreading the, um, you know, the scope or the scale of the business, you're also driving a compliance to the business, which investors are very well placed to do, given that you, you could still control, okay, these are the seven boxes you gotta tick before we invest in you and listen, profit is just one of them. There's six other things you gotta comply with, right? So I think that's the biggest thing that could be brought in by investors. Noted. Thank you, AK. Sylvia, did you have thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Love the compliance point. I think just having thought a bit about it now, and I mean, that's just an idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure if, if it's good, but I'll throw it out there. Uh, given that usually investors are quite focused around um, a specific sector, let's put it like that, uh, or have at least three or four specific companies invested in a, in a sector, it makes them quite suitable to get involved a little bit more in the lobbying side, yeah, I would say, um, rather than a company uh, by itself as such. Yeah. Um, so I think an investor could play a substantial role, especially when it goes around the social impact businesses that, that we are in, to um, assist with lobbying. And I mean, uh, government involvement, and I mean, Elizabeth knows much more about this, but like, it is crucial to set certain minimum requirements, but I think it is just so important to get a common ground understanding between industry and government. Yeah? And that, that leads to realistic expectations and, and, uh, and, and correct setup of rules that leads again, coming to the compliance point that AK raised to companies having to be compliant, but also in a realistic manner. Yeah. Um, so 
it's kind of an ecosystem where I nearly see an investor playing a crucial role to to form part of the lobbying because of the of the um, stronger involvement in various companies and stronger footing through that to talk to governments. It's just an idea. <laughs> no, I think it's a great one. Um, and at least from, I think, I'm in a privileged spot of working at Open Societies Foundation that does have various entities that are working on mm. influencing policy. So that's po more possible for us, but I do think that the private sector can also just reach out to unions or to different um, you know, civic organizations or, or uh, parties to see, to make these connections or at least try to convene um, all stakeholders together. Um, but Elizabeth, I think this may touch more on some of the work that IDWF does as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, of course, the investor invests uh, because of profit. And I think it is important for them to understand that, you know, uh, uh, sometimes uh, they can get both, you know, they can get profit, but then they can also uh, be promoting uh, social justice. Uh, I, I have seen examples of uh, uh, company uh, I mean, there is a, a recruitment agency, a recruitment of a migrant domestic workers agency in Hong Kong, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, you know, pledge that uh, they will uh, do the business uh, in compliance with the law. Uh, and, and the most uh, important piece is not to uh, charge uh, excessive uh, agency fees from the migrant domestic workers. And for a long, long time, uh, uh, there is a belief that if you don't charge uh, you know, so-called enough fees, then you will lose out, you know, you will not earn anything. Uh, but then this uh, company, uh, no, they, uh, they pledge that uh, they, and uh, that they believe that uh, it, it, by complying with the law, they can still uh, run the business and then they can still make a profit. Uh, uh, and after a few years, uh, the company has uh, thrived. Uh, and uh, and is providing uh, excellent uh, recruitment services uh, to uh, local citizens in Hong Kong, and 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 they have proven, you know, that uh, you know profit and uh, uh, and labor rights, you know, can can go hand in hand, and uh, uh, and and really, you know, investors uh, have to be bold, you know, to to to, to be uh, to encourage uh, innovative uh, methods. And now there are more and more companies which have uh, discussed with us, you know, how uh, they can encourage their their employees, uh, for example, when hiring uh, domestic workers, uh, respect uh, gender equality, promote gender equality, promote labor rights by establishing a code of conduct uh, in the company and providing uh, training to their employees on, on uh, how, how to do this uh, and also uh, uh, establish a reward uh, program for those who, who, you know, who are able uh, to, uh, to fulfill uh, uh, you know, what the company expect them uh, according to the code of uh, practice and 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 these are excellent uh, models you know that can uh, promote uh, uh, gender equality labor rights but at the same time you know keep business uh, in good shape thank you elizabeth um, i'm just going to quickly switch I, I realize we're running out of time and we've had some questions come in so i'm going to try to um, just launch into those um, one came in for AK, and I do think, though, that it we would also like to get some input from Elizabeth. Um, the question is, as mentioned, a lot of workers in a certain socioeconomic strata have no formal paperwork that enables Clay to undertake effective background checks. What steps do, does Clay take to remedy this? Does the company help those people to obtain paperwork, make efforts to hold the government accountable or not consider those people for employment at all. So I think that is a direct question for you, but then also I think it could be helpful to hear Elizabeth's take where what you've seen in other countries as it relates to undocumented workers and helping them gain employment. Yeah, thanks for that Anu. It was a, it's a very relevant question given that so many of them 
<clears throat> we're starting to turn up without the adequate paperwork in hand. So there's two kinds of things we do. If there's any kind of paperwork, not current, not um, you know up to date, not up to mark, any paper which has something to do with their identity, we do try to direct them to the other office, which is the local equivalent of the social security number, if you will. Uh, our HR ops staff try to help them get one. Um, we also work with them. We employ them, but uh, we usually put a month's deadline before we can get the paperwork in order. Um, this is as long as there are, the, the police verification is a strict one. That has to be done and we need to make sure there's no criminal record the person is carrying. Post that, if there is nothing like that, we do work with them. In a few cases where there is nothing at all from their end, we don't even have a starting point. So as a company, we have in, you know, gotten into a dialogue with the Ministry of Women and Child Affairs. We deal with them for a lot of other things as well because we come under their purview for daycare. And this is a subject we've brought to their attention several times. I think with illegal immigration, with several other factors that the ministry is facing, this is not a problem they would be able to solve in a hurry. I think there is a large number of steps being taken to see how everybody in the country can have paperwork. And that's a massive project in itself. And it's raised some, a lot of controversies on the side too, which I'm sure all of us have read about. It's not an easy project by any means. What we can do if there's, I mean, if there's at least a historical address in the past, which is not current anymore, different city, we still try to help you get the paperwork. That's, that's the best we can do because, you know, these things take a lot of time and effort. It needs a full-time person to be working with this. We do it wherever we can. Uh, and we have helped quite a few manage to get their other cards, but it doesn't always work. We do our best. Yes, this is a, a challenge faced by many women uh, in uh, in some countries. Uh, yeah, as AK said, you know, for example, in, in India. Uh, and uh, what uh, we are trying to do is uh, is to raise the awareness uh, among uh our our members uh you know that this is something uh, uh which are very important if they want to get a proper uh employment so that uh, they will start uh you know taking steps you know either to uh uh, you know, uh, approach their village head or the, the municipal government, uh, you know, to, to address this uh, problem to get the paper, but they, they have to do it uh, as, as early as possible, you know, not wait until the time that they, you know, they really, uh, uh, you know, are going to, to find a job. But, you know, even before they, uh, they, they start uh, finding uh, a job, but they have to to prepare this early because it really it really takes time. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, this is this is a huge challenge. Uh, and among our members, you know, there are uh, more challenges. You know, when uh, some of these women uh, 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 might have migrated and work in uh, in the foreign countries. And, uh, and, and uh, this is uh, especially very challenging, you know, uh, during this time under the COVID-19 uh, and uh, because they are undocumented, uh, they lose their job. And then they also uh, have a difficulty uh, to seek help from their embassies in order to go home uh, because of the lack of papers. Uh, and, uh, and what we are trying is to, um, uh, organize uh, local community to provide uh, uh, services to them, you know, so that they can, you know, at least uh, have shelter. Uh, but uh, the most important thing is really to to uh, talk to the government uh, to, to provide, uh, uh, you know, counseling uh, so that uh, they they will be able to uh, at least uh, fly home. Yeah, as other workers with documents. Yes, uh, very unfortunate situation indeed. Um, so we have run over time, um, but I think it's very interesting and we still had uh, other questions to address. So clearly we could uh, continue this on. So I'm happy to take any conversations offline. 
Um, but overall, really want to thank the panelists so, so much for, for giving us your time and insights and sharing your experiences and, um, and thoughts on this really relevant, important topic. Um, again, encourage people who have uh, joined this session to, to reach out to anybody um, that you've uh, seen in the session or any of the panelists if you have any uh, questions or any conversations you'd like to have um, further. And with that, thank you so much for joining and um, have a great day, everybody.